All right, I'm back. Long video, guys, but no, wait, wait. Before you leave, I know that you see the video is long. You just need to watch the beginning. Uh, the end or the the final long part is where I go on the rant and I, I talk about how the project is made in depth. You don't need to watch that. Let's just watch the beginning, okay? So wanted to say today that the Ludo project, I'm wrapping it up. It's completed. It's out there. It's public. It's sourced. Is in the comment section down below or on my GitLab. You can find the link, basically. Uh, and let's have a look at this over here, right? So I got four of these nice boxes. Those are all Unity build connecting to localhost right now. Yep, they're all connecting. Everybody has a different name. This is me. My name is Michael. How you doing? Everybody knows I'm Michael now. This is Dave, my best friend. I actually don't have a best friend named Dave, but okay, let's hit start. Now everybody gets to be on the board. We know it's the red player turn. We can hit on this button, that button. Nobody's getting through. You know this game. This game is really annoying. As long as you don't get a six, you don't get out of your house, which is why I put a cheat button. So here on the right hand side, disable that before you put it live. But um, yeah, you have the option to click on six and then pull one of your piece out. You also have uh, different roles you can do. And yeah, it just keeps on going like that. The game is working. It's not very pretty, but it is highly customizable in um, in terms that you can actually change the tile around. You can add tiles. You can move the position of the tile and uh, the, the pieces will be on top of them. And you also should change the art before you release it. Yeah. So that being said, I went through the code. I've added a bunch of comments at a bunch of different places. Went through it, cleaned it up a little bit, but I didn't do like everything that needs to be done. One thing left that I've mentioned here at the top of the lobby scene, it's a very small script. You don't really have to do that, but you should. It's um, as pointed out in the comment section down below, somebody said that using the animator would be a, a bad practice for the sole purpose that every time you update something in the animator, it refreshes the dirty state of the canvas, meaning the whole UI has to be redrawn, which is of course, it's not really optimal. Um, I was under the impression that when you stop your animation, that would not happen, but that is uh, that has been proven false, and therefore, feel free to change it the way you'd like. I will also put a link here on how to optimize uh, your UI, so if you click on that, and it says it down here, if you're going to put the animator, make sure it's an object that actually changes every single frame, um, else you should be using a tweening system, or you could just write transform.position and, and do your manual things. Uh, something that is funny here as well, since I'm here, avoid the use of camera.main, this is no longer true, you can use that because now this is being cached on the engine side. Okay, tangent. Now let's have a look at how to get this project. All you have to do is head over to gitlab.com, my name, and the online Ludo project. In here you can hit clone, you can download this uh, directly, I believe like this, as a zip file, or you could also clone, of course, through git clone. Once you open up the project, you are gonna have something, uh, not this one, this one, you're gonna have the project that looks like this. Which leads me on to the second part of this uh, tutorial. And now if you're not interested in the deep dive of this video, this is where you would actually click off. However, if you do so, please drop a like, because last time we had a lot of likes and it helped me make more videos. Also, I'm wrapping up um, the board games in general chapter this month, and then we're gonna go into real time uh, next month. That's gonna be fun. Okay, I'll see you in the second section. Cheers. All right, and our next step is to look at the actual project. So if you decide to actually download this project, you want to modify it, you want to create your own Ludo game, uh, you're free to do so, I don't mind. You can take the code, you can publish it, you can monetize it, you can do all of that if you wish. You have my vocal, verbal, verbal permission right now to do so. So, um, but if you do intend to actually branch this out and you want to give back to say the community, you could go ahead and make some art, make your own game and uh, push it as a as a merge request or a fork or whatever you feel like. But of course, if you do that, let me know in um, a Discord. You can drop me a DM there, we can arrange something. And uh, yeah, make sure everybody get access to that. Uh, if not, that's also fine. So what I'm gonna be talking over here is if you do decide to get this code and you want to modify it, we're gonna go into the code and actually uh, give the big high lines that you could um, Give the, give the flow, right? Let's have a look at the project, basically. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, it's very simple. We have two scenes. One of them is the lobby, and the other one is the game. By the time you get inside of the game, you're going to be connected. Uh, the connection is happening in the lobby, and the lobby has the network manager. Under the network manager, I have default settings. Only three network prefab. One of them is the player controller. It's a prefab I use as some sort of... 
Um, if a player connects, I want all of his information under his player controller. That's his player prefab. That's where I store the most top level information for him. We'll see that in a bit. Uh, the game manager is also network because it has network variables in it. And then every single little pieces are also network because I want to be able to move their position and um, have that reflected to everybody, basically. We only have two scenes, as mentioned. We're using the unit transport and all of that is being configured to connect locally. Now, if you'd like to connect to um, an external IP, you can have a look at the video I've done uh, recently or I'm about to do on the channel about opening my port for the chess game. Uh, it's not the same protocol, it's not the same transport layer, but it's basically the same principle. Okay, let's have a look at the lobby scene script. So the lobby screen, uh, the lobby scene script, as uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier, we are using a animator to move things around. So as you see here, if I press on main, I connect and then I move my, um, my canvas using the animator. Not a good practice because of course, the uh, the canvas every time you move it through the animator and it's always being considered as being moved when it's in a animation even if you even if you turn off the animation so that's something i realized um that i did not think was the case so even if you end the animation you have to disable the animator for it to actually um stop using resources you could say so it's not a good practice to have that on the ui so it, what, what you can actually do here is move them manually so move the panels manually and when I talk about the panels, I'm talking about, for example, this one and this one. You can move them manually and that's not going to cost uh, much resources. But what I, I actually left it here. I don't care about doing that for the sole purpose that the game is, you know, it's not, it's not really expensive to run to do that. And the scene only contains that, you could say. So the only expensive thing you could say is this. I don't need to do any modification to that. That's what I think. If you want to be super optimal and you want to do some good practice, feel free to do so. You can also branch it out and I'll merge it. I'll gladly merge that. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm pretty much done with this project. <laughs> okay, so that's the lobby scene, basically. It has something so you can connect as a host, as a client, and a back button so you can shut down and try again. Um, when we press on lobby start button, we do a switch scene. Of course, only the host can do that. So. Uh, if you press this as a client, not going to work. And when you do click that, everybody who's connected will be swapping to the game scene at the same time. So when the host click this, the client will also be brought with him. Next up, we have the submit name change. That is actually a button that is right here, this button. And when you enter a name input and you press on that button, you have a new name um, server wide that is being broadcast to every other client and every other client can see you as that name, okay? Next up, we have the game scene. The game scene contained this UI here at the beginning. So your player name and also your color. If you're the blue player and your, your name is Dave, you're gonna see Dave with a blue color there. In the middle, you have the roll button. Depending on which color the button is, it will, it will say whose turn it is. So if it's blue, it means it is Dave's turn. But at the beginning, it starts as red because it's gonna be the red player turn. He's the first one. Now, if you're going to actually try to um, take this code and, and push it out there, you're going to want to disable the cheat role object over here. And this is so I can just test things out, right? So this is how I force a certain value when I roll my dice. So for example, when I want to test things out and I want my, um, my pieces to be out of the board, then I click on six. So I force myself a six roll and then I get to play again after that. So just uh, be aware of that you can disable this thing um, and if you want to be even safer than that not only can you disable but a little bit later on i'll show you how to remove this uh code cave you could say so if you're trying to trigger this manually through through code right <laughs> all right so as mentioned we have the game manager this one is a script but it's also a network object and most of the logic actually happens in here that's where most of the meat is going to be we first start by having three variable. Whose turn is it? It's a ulong because uh, the client ID is actually set as ulong, uh, yeah, as ulongs. Then we have the current dice roll. So what is your current dice roll from one to six? What is what is it that you roll with dice? And I also have a boolean for move completed. So this is to make sure that everybody is forced to do a move if they have the option to do so, and then they can't roll until they actually did their move. Okay. Um, so here a couple of reference a piece prefab which is the network piece prefab we have a path container this contains this object over here 
so board position and then just beneath it, I believe we have the uh, start position container and it's right here. So as you can see, as I highlight this, it's all the tiles from the board and here is all the tiles from the start position and those are all positioned manually. So if you wish, what you could do is actually uh, move this around and the piece, when it gets to that turn, the piece is actually gonna go on top of this tile. So you can actually move this around if you don't like the I don't want to say the Nazi cross, but like if you don't like this layout, you can actually change it all together and say, hey, you know what, we're going to do something like a little path like that. And it's going to be a little bit more kid friendly, you could say, as long as you leave them in the right order and under um, the object over here, it's going to work. So you could actually run this and then the piece would start there. That one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, and they would take the same exact route. So when we position these piece, they use the transform dot position of these objects over here. That being said, uh, start position container is just to make sure that we start things in the right order at the right place. And if one of your piece gets eaten, then it's being put back to the to the start position. Right. All right. Server side values. This is all for the board logic. So if you want to get um, deep into that, you can have a look. Uh, player ready is just to make sure everybody's ready at the beginning of the game. So this is only used once player pieces is every player has four pieces and they're being uh, put under their dictionary over here. Completed is when a player is done playing. That's when he won. Basically, this is used. So when we call um, next turn, uh, we skip the people who have completed the game. And if there's only one person who hasn't completed the game, we just end the game at that point. Um, the paths over here is the important one. So path is is the individual path for all the team. So for example, here we have the red team, the red team starts over here. And the path for the red team is to go all the way across this, come back and at this style, instead of going forward, instead of going to 51, in that case, that's 50, that's 51. Instead of going there, he goes to 52, which is in here. And then we just enter the red player's house like so. So that's the path for the red player. For the green player, when he gets to 51, uh, 50, he goes up to 51 and then back at zero. And then he goes on until he reaches to that point and then enter his house. So every player has a different piece path um, and they're being stored down here. This might, this could have been actually a U-long to match the, uh, the client ID, but I didn't put that there. Um, not a big deal, I probably cast it at one point. Then here we have the start position being um, being assigned based off the start position container. Here I have the most important object, which is a Ludo tile array of um, that is called board. We'll go over to Ludo tile in a bit. Finally, we have the final tile. So when somebody reach one of these final tiles, we're going to be doing a victory check. Finally, roll count this turn. This is actually to um, this is when you roll a six, you actually are allowed to roll again. And then if you roll a six, you're also allowed to roll again up to three times. If on your third roll, you roll a six again, we have to reset everything and just allow the other person to play. Well, not reset, but like you, you skip your turn at that point. So if you're too lucky, then you skip your turn. And that is why this value is there. Now can roll again is if you roll the six, we'll see that in the logic a little bit later on. Client side values. So this is only for um, interacting with the piece. So as yourself, as a player, if so, if you're the blue player, you're going to have an array with four pieces. Those are your four pieces on the board. It's going to be useful to enable disable colliders. It's going to be useful for um, changing a couple of things that is going to allow you to select which piece to move. And then finally, UI reference. So we can change all of that. They're quite, quite explanatory themselves. So I don't need to go with that. Some cons value just to do some maths. And then we start with the actual logic. In the awake, we create the path for every single team. So that is the path value that we saw over here. As I've mentioned, if you're the player uh, red, when you reach tile number 50, you don't go to 51, you go to 52, 3, 4, 5, 6 instead. So this function over here, we'll do it for all the team. It gives the proper offset. It's been tested, so it's pretty cool. Initiate the board array. So this is to make sure that um, we, we create a board, a Ludo tile for every single tile in the array. 
uh, set the start position, self-explanatory, final tiles are being set manually over here, and they are actually being set by using the paths of the team and doing tile count minus one. Okay, in our start, we were just there for any events. These events are the following. So when the current turn changes, when the dice roll changes, and when the move complete also change. Those are the events, so we register for these events at the beginning. And then we call on player ready server RPC with our local client ID, which would mean that um, when we are done loading as a client or as a server, we then send this message over to the server, which says, okay, we are ready. And if all the players are ready, then we go ahead and we, um, we spawn all the players. So we wait until everybody loaded the scene, everybody launched their network start, and once that is completed, we spawn all the players. How do we spawn all the players? Well, we first start by assigning some values, and then we just go through a for loop for every single active uh, player. We create them in new piece array, and then we instantiate, and we spawn it with ownership. So spawning this on the network with ownership. Okay. And that's it for the start. Then we have a network start. If we are the owner, we're just going to set some values so our logic can start well. So we're going to say the move completed is equal to true, just so when it's time to roll, this value is true and we can go ahead and, um, and roll without being said, hey, you, you haven't completed your move yet. So this is only for the owner, for the sole purpose that the owner is the only person who takes care of the moving logic. We didn't have the undestroy function, which we don't need, but uh, it's right there. So in case we decide to just destroy this and go on to a second part of our game, or in case we're integrating a Ludo game inside of an existing game, and then you want to get rid of all these values, uh, you can delete the board. And by deleting the board, we're also going to unregister events, which is going to clean up the event call, and you don't get any no reference on that. Uh, and then in the update statement, we just look, is it our turn? And if it's our turn, we're going to be shooting Raycast out of our mouse, to see if we're actually hitting uh, active pieces. In case we are actually hitting those active pieces, we're gonna say move piece uh, with the actual piece component, which is gonna detect which one it is and then move it on the board. Okay, um, actually it's not going to detect it. Uh, move piece is gonna be called here with the piece and then inside of a utility function, I'll detect which one it is, so which one that we clicked on and then we'll call the move piece server RPC, which is then going to attempt to move your piece on the server side. So if we skip to that, oh, F12, with the index position, we can tell which one is the player's piece because we have the index position over here. So we have the client ID, client ID and his index position. We can then get the piece on the server side. Why did I not send the piece? Because you can't send the piece through an RPC since it's not a serializable um, object. So instead I just send an index and then I get the client ID through here. Um, you could technically serialize it if you made it serializable, if you went ahead and you overridden a couple of values for the piece, but I haven't done that. Instead, I just need to send the index because the server also has a reference to um, whose piece. Well, it has a reference to all the pieces basically. <laughs> so. Uh, and then we go through some check to, to see if we're actually allowed to move. Are we in play? Um, we're going to find our index on the actual board. Are we killing any piece? If so, we can delete that piece, move the piece to position, and then at the end, check if we are winning. So if we're on the final tile. Now, if we're not allowed to roll again, which is only set, we're going to see quite soon, it's only being set if we hit a six, we're going to call next turn. Speaking of which, let's go see next turn. In the next turn, all I do is uh, first save the value of whose turn it was, reset the roll count, and then what we do is we create a, <laughs> a U-long array with everybody's turn. So here we have an example, 0, 2, 3, 4, and we put whomever is the person that played last, we put him at the very first spot. So for example here, the fourth player was the last person to play, and then we go over to the next array, the next index. If that person player completed is true, then we move on to the next until we reach the end of the array. Um, at that time, you're going to get someone for sure, or you're going to be the last person standing, which means you have lost. And then there's other condition that will take care of uh, stopping the game. If the next player is done with the game, skip him. Okay, here it is. Okay, 
So that's for next turn. Um, I'm going in a bunch of different orders, but that's actually because the code flow is like that. Let's have a look at uh, the most important one. Um, can move piece here. When we do a dice roll, actually, you know what? Let's do dice roll first. When we roll the dice through a button, um, client side, that is then calling it on the server side. So the dice roll is being, is, um, the dice roll is being done on the server side as well. So you can't fake that on your hand. However, you could through this place over here with the cheat button that we created earlier. Um, we can actually force a certain value. Now we'd have to delete that if you want to be 100% secure. Um, in case you don't really care, we just call it with the dice roll button, the normal one without a force dice. Now let's have a look at the dice roll. We first start with, um, with three matching condition. First, are we allowed to roll again? Or is it the first time we roll? Then we're also going to be checking, is it our turn to roll? And then finally, have we completed our turn? So in case we, we are in the middle of something, we are in the middle of our turn, we're just choosing which piece to move, and then we click on roll. That doesn't work. We have to complete our turn before we roll the dice again. Um, and then we roll, right? So we get a value in between one and six. This is inclusive. I don't actually, this is inclusive on the left and exclusive on the right, meaning that here it's six and here you can also have one. Um, if we roll a six, we set roll again. If we roll a six for the third time, then here we call next turn because we have to skip this one. And here is where it gets cool. So we take the four um, pieces for our player. We create a four array Boolean and we check for every single piece. Can we actually move it? And this is being done in a can move piece, which is only being run on the server, by the way. So this RPC is being run on the server and it's the only function calling the can move piece. So that's cool. Uh, we'll go into that in a bit. If I can move at least one piece, then I got to do it else next turn. Let's have a look at the can move piece. So here we send in the piece, we send in the dice roll. So knowing that we first check by, we first have our first check that says, are we currently at minus one? Minus one means we are inside of our starting position inside of our house, you could say. And then when we're at minus one and we didn't roll a six, we just skip. However, if we did roll a six, we check if there's two people standing on top of our starting position, then we can't actually spawn something. So there's actually a chance over here that we stay inside of the home, even though we rolled a six. Um, and then we find our position on the board. Are we at the limit? So meaning that um, if we're like two tiles away from the end, then we roll a three. That means we're at the limit and we return false. Check if there is any obstruction. So if um, two players of the same team are standing in front of you, you can't go past them. So that is what this algorithm do. And if you've made it through that, all of that condition, then we can actually move. So we return it through. And that's it for the can move piece. Now let's see if I did anything here that is interesting. We pretty much went through all the interesting stuff. So the end button here is just towards the end. We show up a um, a piece of UI. If you click on the button end, it's going to shut down the network manager and move you to the lobby scene. This is local. So scene manager, load scene, not network manager. What else? We have um, these are all based on the events. So every time there's a new turn, new dice, uh, move is completed. We actually change some pieces of UI, as you can see here. And then finally, we have the section at the end that have all the RPCs. Enter piece server RPC is being called when you take a piece from index position minus one. So when it's inside of the house and you take it to its, to its um, starting position. So this is so you can do the, the initial move that is going to help you take your piece outside of the board, basically. And it's being put on the first index of your path's position. Move piece is moving the piece. On player ready is when, of course, when you join dice roll is when you want to roll the dice. Um, and then we have a bunch of client RPCs, which are actually meant for the UI. So when, when somebody wins, we had that player to a list of winner, basically, and it's being done through here. It's a very simple function. So I just go first, second, third, fourth, and then add the name here. So player name. End game is when the game is over. We send that to everybody just to say, Hey, the winner panel put that on active. And then here we have something cool, enable interaction and also disable interaction. 
The only thing this really do is for every single one of your pieces, and that is done through the local piece, I believe. Yeah, local piece array. We're going to enable action for everyone who can move. And um, when it's time to disable the action, because it's no longer your turn, we're going to be disabling it on everybody. Now, what does this do? Game object dot layer, change it to an active piece. That's all. And then, of course, we have a um, in the game we have a, a way to render active piece in a different manner um, than the normal pieces, and we have that through the scriptable rendering pipeline. So here it is. Active pieces are being rendered with the highlight. Well, actually, is a weird color. We should put that on white. Something like that. Or not white because that's going to be hard to see. Hmm. A bright pink. Feel free to change that. You can make a branch if you wish. So that's being done through here. And yeah, the rest is pretty much um, self-explanatory. So at the beginning of a, when we initially start and we create a piece, we assign a starting position. We change the color of that piece to whomever it is. And we also add a box collider if it is ours. So if we are the owner of that piece, we add a box collider because we'll need to be able to hit something when um, we send in our raycast. Now do note that there is only four box collider per game, even if you have four player active, because every single client have their own pieces and only them have access to the box collider on these pieces. And that's it. We also have another RPCs to move them locally, because as I've mentioned in my, in my tips video, you are not allowed to move this because you are not the owner of it. So as a server, Yes, I say to move pieces, but I tell the client to move his own pieces, else we're not going to be able to get the result since uh, somebody that is not the authority of this piece is trying to move it and that doesn't work. So I have to say, hey, Dave, can you please move your piece? And then Dave move his piece and that's being reflected to everybody else. And that's it. Um, the project is pretty much very simple after that. That was still long and a bit complicated, but for a 20 minute video, a whole game is in there. Uh, things that I have not mentioned is, for example, the Ludo camera, which is really hard to tell because it's just a camera that moves on the board using your WASD or the arrow keys. Nothing too, too insane. You can see the script over here. It's just uh, something that uses input.getAccess. I have the Ludo tile object in which uh, is a helper for me to add and remove piece to a certain tile. And when I add and I remove these pieces, I also reposition them. So when um, there is one or more pieces on a single tile, then I put them at certain positions. So that's straight in the center. That's um, one next to each other on the same tile. That's like a triangle formation. And that is a, well, that's four pieces on top of the, the same tile. Things like that are being used as well to help myself. Uh, get how many pieces are on top of this piece and also get the first piece. This is only used to know which team has the control of that board actually. And that's it. One last thing, utility. Utility is something I use because those are public static function to return the team color. Um, re also return the team ID because we have to skip the ID number one as well. And yeah. That should pretty much wrap it up. I am glad that this is over, not because I did not like the project, but because I'd rather do something that is more real time. And I thought it was a really great practice to get this off the ground. If you'd like to add some art, if you'd like to do things with this project, please go ahead. I am more than happy to accept any merge requests or accept any branches that is going to help me make this pretty. It's right here. And um, yeah. With this being said, it's another chapter done. The board game chapter is pretty much completed for me, at least for this year. Uh, the chess one was good. This one was good. And now I'm ready to move on to something that is more real time. And I can bring you a tutorial about real time stuff, which is a little bit more interesting. Um, just to give you a hint, if you made it that far through the video first, I really appreciate you. And second, um, I am working on a couple of things. Actually, I'm working on this system that is going to help me pump out this game much faster. It's the Merkcamp ML API template, and it goes and help me make this game fast. And the template project is something very simple. It's just going to contain a lot of things that is going to help me boot up the project real fast. For example, here I can decide to host. I can decide to connect as a client. I have debug information at the top, and I also have a, a God panel, you could say. Not a God panel, 
well, I guess I guess you could call it a god panel with a um, command line in it. So here, I have a couple of action I could do. I could decide to kick the player two. So if I do F2 again, I'm kicking the player two from the host. This one is not connected. Can decide to reconnect again though. Uh, and, and things like that, right? So just things that are gonna help me fix all of this mess that is starting up the project, have, having people connect to you. And um, I have a bunch of function also that is gonna allow me to give rights to people, view their profile, things like that, eventually connected to a cloud account. And that's what I'm working on, just so I can boot these things faster. Um, if you're interested in that, let me know on Discord, actually. That's the best place to reach me regarding this type of stuff. I've been renting for too long and I need to stop. So thank you so much for watching, everybody. I really appreciate your support. Been getting a lot of likes lately and uh, those likes, they help me get more more impression, more, more people noticing the channel and uh, that means more time is being spent on here and I can create some tech and share it with you and I just receive, I'm actually receiving a call. So I will see you soon, guys. Cheers.